Um, going to give just three points real quick like this morning. Uh, three things to build on this year. These are three things that um, we find in the Bible, uh, in this passage of Scripture. And um, it's pretty amazing at what God can do, especially when you trust in Him and you put your hope and faith in Him and you allow Him to do what He created you to do. He wants to work through you. He wants to do things through you and for you and in you, um, you know, so that your life is, is, is this. Look, the Bible is, it's like a multi-tool that can fix any nut. Right? Yeah. Amen. So, we are in luck. Um, in Acts chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 19. And it says, Then some Jews came to came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. Y'all, this is like today, um, it's like when you have a, a small percentage of the population with the loudest voice and they wind up influencing the entire population by being the loudest. Y'all know the squeaky wheel gets the, the, the grease? and Or is it the squeaky nut gets the wheel? You know? So if you squeak a lot, you get stuff, right? And that's what they did, was these, these folks that came from Antioch and Iconium, these were the same group, the same kinds of folks that cried out for Jesus to be crucified. And then they proclaimed, at the end of it all, they were like, may His blood be on our hands and our children's hands. And here it is. It still is. These people were basically inciting a riot against the church, against Paul. Paul was preaching. He was preaching the Word of God, and it was in opposition to the way that they were living their life, and most importantly, the truth of the Word of God was hurting their business. Because in their synagogue, they had a pretty good racket going on where people would bring them money and they would offer them forgiveness and different things like that, for their money. So it was a good business that they had going on, and then Jesus come and wrecked it all by telling them the truth. That you can't buy forgiveness. Forgiveness only comes through bloodshed, because the wages of sin is death. So something has to die to pay for sin. Now for a long time, God was accepting people sacrificing animals, you know, because it cost them something. It was a sacrifice, it was a payment for sin, and it was symbolic and something that they had to do without because of their sin. And now they're just like, let's do away with this Paul. They took him out, it says, they stoned him and dragged him outside of the city thinking he was dead. So, a stoning in that day, what it is, is they would tie somebody up to, normally there's a post in the middle of town, and you know how they put fountains and stuff there now? Or a little garden at Central Park or something? Well, it used to just be a post where they would take people or kids or something like that and make a big spectacle out of the punishment. <clears throat> they threw rocks as big as they could pick up, okay? Um, and just threw rocks at him. You can't dodge it. You can't move away from it. He was getting hit in the head, in the body. I don't know how many bones were broken. I don't know how many concussions he had. I don't know. But they thought he was dead. It was so bad. Now, if you take a person and you hit them with rocks until you think they're dead, I got to think that that's going to be a bloodied, mangled up mess. Right? Probably. All he did was preach. All he did was tell them the truth. And they couldn't stand it. So... They were killing this man for preaching. Verse 20 says, But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. Okay. That day in which he looked as though he was dead, he got up and went back to town. He went back to where they killed him, where they tried to. He went back there. You're talking about defiance. It wasn't about defiance. 
All wanted to show them the power of God. All wanted them to see. You tried to stop that which God had anointed. You tried to shut it down. And God is just bringing it right back. Y'all know that if you try to shut down what God has anointed, there is no shutting it down. I mean, it's just not. It, the attempts will be futile. You cannot stop God. You can't. You can get in His way and you can be removed, but you cannot stop God. So, these guys went back into the city. It said the very next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So they went on a mission trip the very next day. If you were concussed and, and bleeding and broken and everything like that, would you want to go on a long walk the next day? Probably not, right? You're probably not going to want to ride a donkey. You're probably not going to want to ride a boat. You know, I mean, it's like, hey, I just got hit by a hundred rocks yesterday. Let's go on a cruise. Yeah, right? It'll help, right? Don't cruises help? Supposedly? I don't know. They may, they may not. <clears throat> Verse 21 says, They preached the good news in that city, and they won a large number of disciples. Y'all, this is where he met Timothy in Derby, And they got to see Timothy's family. And then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for, for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Now, the three things I want to talk to you about is we can take this lesson from, from Paul here. And I got, I got three E words since, I'm, since we're, we're all Baptist, okay? Um, Something that we need to develop into a discipline for this um, this next phase of our life, or if you've never done it, start it today. It's just it's evangelism. People now more than ever need to hear about Jesus, but they also need to see Jesus at work in our lives. Paul believed in the message so much. This was the same man who believed that he was truthful in his beliefs, so much so that he went around silencing Christians, killing them, persecuting them for believing in this way. Well, he met Jesus and his whole life changed to the point now where he's willing to die for what he believes in. Folks, it's very easy to have that mindset of willing to die for your beliefs if you've already died to self. You cannot have a faith worth dying for if you have never died to sin, if you've never died to self. You can't. You're too selfish. You've got to let go of stuff. The only way to be saved is to surrender to God. People need to see a surrendered church now more than ever. Don't people need to see a real faith now? They need to. Let me tell you, I read this story a preacher told, a preacher out of Houston. Uh, it's about a man named Jack. Jack was a very successful businessman. Went to college, had, was a CEO of a company, had very nice things. He also got cancer. And in the process of battling this cancer, his company just let him go. Just Put him aside. He wound up living off his savings, his retirement. And after rounds of chemo and radiation, he was still terminal. Well, one of the deacons in this man's church heard about it and they wanted to go visit with him and talk to him and maybe offer him some hope. And when they talked to him and, and he asked him the question, he said, Jack, <clears throat> When life on earth is done, do you, do you know where you will spend eternity? That's what he asked him. And the man got upset. And he said, all I ever hear about from you Christians is what God will do for you after you're dead. 
I want to know what God's going to do for me while I'm alive. And he was just mad. Mad at God, mad at, at the deacon, mad at the preacher for being there. He didn't want any hope. And he told him, he said, you know, my wife, when I die, she's going to be penniless. My kids are not going to have money for college. Everything that I had worked so hard for is gone now. And I'm about to be. And they told him, he said, you can live on. Jack died about a month later, never accepting Christ. But before he died, that deacon had it on his heart to go back and see Jack one more time. He went back and he saw Jack. And he told him, he said, Jack, I don't know where you stand with God at the moment, but I just want to let you know that God has been working behind the scenes to maybe give you some peace of mind. Um, say I talked to a, a realtor in our church. Huh, you're a realtor, aren't you? Um, here's you an idea. Realtor said that they would sell their home and give her all the commission, and that way she could put it back for college and stuff like that. And he said, me and some other families in the church, um, we want to make the house payments until the house is sold. Uh, there's another man in our church that owns an apartment complex down the road. He needs some, a resident. He's willing to give you a place to live. It's three bedrooms uh, and pay you a salary every month if you would just schedule repairs. You can l live there rent-free, all your utilities paid. That God loves you. And God works through God's people to help other people see the love of God. He said, Jack cried like a baby, but would never surrender his heart to Jesus Christ. After he died, everything went like they had planned, and Jack's widow and Jack's children all got saved. They were not shut off. They were feeling the love of God. And it would have been very easy for that deacon and that preacher to be like, they're not receptive. I gave it a shot. You know, they don't want it. Paul could have very easily said, they just stoned me. He went right back at it. Now more than ever, something that we need to develop into a discipline is evangelism. Showing people what God can do. Showing people the power of God. You know? I mean, I don't know of, of, of any life-changing way. I mean, you can get Tony Robbins with his 800 teeth smiling at you, giving you a pep talk. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Okay? Y'all don't know who I'm talking about, do you? That's fine. Um, he did hand them down to Rex Ryan, though, if you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Yep, she's Googling that. <laughs> Huh. I wonder if it would finish typing it out for you. Rex Ryan, Tony Robbins' teeth. Would it? They, they just got really white teeth. That's all it is. All right. Um, anyway. In, not just in, in this new year, but in our world, um, that evangelism is, is, is paramount. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, he said, when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast. I can't brag, you know, about anything that has happened to me. When I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. And then he says, woe to me if I fail to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. He finally got to a place spiritually to where, have you ever felt in your soul, whoa? And I ain't talking about like Joey Lawrence, whoa. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about whoa. You know? Like, just overwhelming sadness, whoa. It's, it's, it's the most unhappy and unsettled that you could ever be. 
That's what woe is. And that's how Paul felt if he couldn't preach. How many of you kids have pitched a fit because your phone or your tablet or something like that got took away? Huh? That is a little bit of woe. It's a little bit of woe. It's like woo. Okay? Your world is falling apart, isn't it? Because you don't have the thing. You don't have the, 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 the stuff. I don't have it. I don't have access to it. I don't have it. My life's going to stop. We went to uh, Birmingham the other day. We got all the way to Harpersville. And I, I went to check something on my phone. I was like, oh, I left it at the house. Oh, well. <laughs> it wasn't a woe. I didn't say, whoa, let's turn around. I was like, oh, well. <laughs> she had a phone. Maggie had a phone. Everybody else has got one. I mean, y'all probably make my truck talk to me if you want to, right? It already wants to drive itself. It puts the brakes on by itself. It starts flashing on the dash when nothing is in the road. I'm like, is it trying to kill me? It's creating woe. Right? No. All right. Um, second thing. And this is something that I think we can do anytime, anywhere. You ready? You ready? Encourage. The, the Bible has a big word called exhort. All right? Exhortation. It's just encourage. If we focus on evangelism, sharing our faith, and we encourage one another, I, hmm. I'm going to get a little wound up. You right? You right? To live in this world, it takes a certain amount of courage to get up, to get dressed, to get out of your house, to go out into public, and to be around other human beings, to be around other folks. It takes courage. It takes courage to go out and be a part of society, to find a job, to find a career, to pay your bills. It takes courage to put yourself out there, to trust another human being and hope that they reciprocate that. And it's love. You know what I mean? Have a relationship. It takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there because you fear being rejected, failing, and all these things, right? It takes courage to live. We need to encourage each other to make living better because the world is full of discouragers that just run your courage off to make it to where you're scared of everything. Y'all, a couple years ago, they had us scared. We was walking around like bandits. Walking around like, woo, the hair's going to get us. All right, so we was bandits. All right, then everybody got COVID. A lot of people died. Some people didn't. And then we still got the flu. Now we, what else we got? We got all kinds of stuff. People are going to die. There's still people dying of cancer. There's people dying of heart attacks. There's people dying of all kinds of stuff. And if you think about it way too much, you will not have courage to live. You will live in fear. And fear is the opposite of courage. Amen? It is, ain't it? So what the devil wants to do is get you living in fear so that you never have the courage to be a Christian in the world. You're just scared all the time. So we just mask up. We stopped having church for a while. All kinds of stuff. And the devil's just like, ha ha, got them right where I want them. Yeah. I don't know what that was, but it's a good. It's a church stomp. One time a day. This is how you develop this as a discipline, okay? Evangelism is just letting Jesus talk, live, just be through you. Encouragement. I need to start every single day. What could I say good to somebody else? What could I do to help somebody else's courage? There are people that you run into every single day that need to hear the words, it's okay, it's going to be all right. I love you. You can do this. Hang in there. People need to hear this. It's encouraging, right? Because the more we hear this stuff, the more courage wells up inside of us and we start believing. Jim, I'm glad that you told me that, that you enjoyed coming to church. I'm not as scared to preach to you anymore now. I don't think he's going to pull out a gun and like, I don't like you no more. Psst. You know, it can happen nowadays, right? So. You have encouraged me to not be so afraid to preach to you. 
Now, everybody hadn't told me that they enjoyed it. So I might still be scared of some of y'all. You didn't never tell me you enjoyed it. Not today, okay. He said, no. <laughs> um, when we do encourage one another, we, it, is, it, is, it is a contagious thing that... Y'all know how old stuff nowadays gets, gets to be viral and it's normally a TikTok or, or a disease, right? And it just spreads like crazy. Um, I've always thought for years that Jesus is the greatest virus the world has ever seen. Because He is contagious. He can change your life. And once you've had Him, you are never the same. And you thought COVID was something. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Yeah. That was the next verse in that Ann Wilson song, I think. Anyway, the third thing for us to work on, besides evangelism and encouraging, it's, it's exalting. I'm going to tell you something. These people right here, Paul and Barnabas, they went to this new church and it says in verse 23 that they appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord. I want you to know that there ain't nobody that can be as holy as you in your body. Did you know that? Oh, man. I want to build you up. Let me hang in. Come on now. This is Rainy Boozer now. For the one and only. Sixth grade. Seventh grade. Uh, Clay County Junior High. Right? or Clay County Central, or Central or Clay County Junior High. There's a lot of letters. All right, it's best contributed. Have you ever thought, is there something that you can't be or can't do? You know, like limits? We all have felt limits in our life. And, and it could be a limit for anything. It could be a physical limit. It could be a, a, a mental limit or an intelligence limit. We all felt like we're, we're less than in some kind of way. All right? When God made you, He said, well done. See, God don't create a human being and mess up on it. Right? Can't, wait a minute, let me tell you some things that God can't do. God can't make a mistake. Okay? He can't. And so when God made you, God did not make a mistake. He made you. You were wonderfully and fearfully made. Okay? God put a lot of thought and effort into you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows what's going to take place in your life. Do you think that God would have made you and made you who you are to be a failure? Or to be less than in any kind of way? I mean, I can run as fast as some folks. I mean, I can jump as high as some folks. I mean, I have the memory of some folks. But I can do what God has called me to do. See, Paul and these guys were following God's Holy Spirit. So when they went to a new church, they saw other people there, and they decided that we need to build them up. We need to encourage these guys. We need to edify these guys. We need to let them... Find their purpose. So what we're going to do is we're going to give them some responsibilities. And that's the way they can fail and succeed. Everybody needs to learn how to lean on the Lord before they get supported by Him. Right? Well, these guys appointed them, committed them to the Lord because they had put their trust in God. 
you know what you're going to be when you grow up. Let me tell you. You want to know? Whatever God wants you to be. Ain't you God's child? Then you're going to be what God wants you to be, right? There's no mistakes in that. I don't care if you are a, a veterinarian or if you're just cleaning out the dog pen. All right? One end, of, well, not one end, of, but both ends of the spectrum. Okay? <laughs> yeah. You're going to be the best Rainy that I know. Right? Just like he's the best Robert Hickey that I know. There can't nobody else be him. There can't nobody else serve the Lord the way Robert Hickey can for Robert Hickey. You know, the, the greatest Christians in the world didn't realize they were doing anything great. They were just being obedient, right? I mean, history books look back on what God accomplished through them. It's like, oh, these people were obedient. They did great things. So I want to encourage you today that let God live through you. Let the Word of God mold you, work on you, and, and help you to see, wait a minute, God's got a purpose for me. God made me. He let me live here. Everything that has happened goes under the blood of Jesus. My mistakes, my past, my good stuff, all of it is under the blood of Jesus. And the future is going to be under the blood of Jesus. Everything in life is under the blood of Jesus. If you've put it there, once you place your life in the hands of Jesus, it says that He is faithful and just to forgive. It says there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So that means we're forgiven. We're not going to face judgment by Almighty God. We're forgiven. It don't stop there. That's just the start, right? It would have been very easy for God to... Once a person gets saved, they just drop dead. Just like that, wouldn't it? That way they don't sin no more. That way they're just like the thief on the cross and, and where he's, he's told Jesus, he said, please remember me. Jesus said, oh, you, you go and be with me today in paradise. So just right away, just bypass the whole baptism church membership thing, right? You're just going to go be with me. That would have been so easy, wouldn't it? If we would have just all died the moment we got saved, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it have been great? I don't know about all that great stuff, right? It would have been a lot less struggle. It, it would have been a lot easier, but not more beneficial. I thank God that He gives us time here on earth to grow and to learn and to experience things. The amount of struggle is kind of a good sign. Ain't it? Ain't it? If, if the devil, if you were in the devil's hands, do you think he'd be messing with you? Stop. 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 I'll tell you this, though. I would be very afraid if I was a Christian and my life was going perfect. Every time I am in prayer and I can't think of a tragedy going on at the moment, I've lived long enough to know that there must be one on the horizon because this world is not the final stop. This world is a place we're just passing through and there's going to be many struggles. Jesus even said, in this world, you will have many kinds of trouble. And it's going to keep on going. But that's okay. Because God is with us. Ain't He? He's going to be with us. He's not going to let us go. He's not going to let us fail. He's not going to let us go into ruin and condemnation. It's going to be all right. Today, do you feel in your soul, in your heart, as though you have trusted God? And are you ready for God to encourage you and to set you up on a higher plane and give you a new thing to do? 
Are you trusting in Him? Are you ready to let go of that fear that is crippling your courage and get on to the next step? Are you ready? God's going to do something through somebody in here today that is, you're not ready for this. All you got to do is surrender and say, God, I don't know what's happening, but I feel like you're calling me to something. That's what those guys in the church were saying to Paul and Barnabas. I feel God's Holy Spirit and I don't know what to do with it. Well, I'm giving you a position. I'm giving you a place. If you don't know what to do, I'm asking you today. Pray for me. Pray for our church. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your loved one. Show them Jesus. If you don't trust Him, trust Him today. Let's all stand. We'll sing an invitation to Him. If you need to pray to God, take this time to do so.